welcome back, everybody, to Constructive Uncoupling, the podcast devoted to amicable divorces. I'm Judy Weigel, your host and amicable divorce expert. Why? Because that's all I do, is amicable divorces. But today, we have two guests that stray outside of that field a little bit. Our topic is on domestic violence, and we have two revered people on the show. We have Alice LaViolette, who is not only a therapist specializing in this area, but she's an expert witness in court, which speaks boatloads to your credentials, Alice, and I want to thank you for being on the show today. You're welcome, me. And, and Warren is a uh, Warren Shield is an attorney who I just adore because he's one of these attorneys that's thorough, good, smart, has excellent relationships, but is a very kind human being. And I want to welcome you back again, Warren, to the show. Thank you, Judith. So this is, a, this is a podcast about amicable divorces, and I know the topic of domestic violence doesn't really fit, but it's important because it comes up. And I, so I want to explore domestic violence to define what it is, where it comes from, what to expect from it during a divorce, and how to handle it legally. So let's go with uh, the questions um, that I've outlined for this program first. And this is to Alice. Alice, could you please explain to our audience the difference between domestic violence, anger management, and aggression? Well, in a very simple way, aggression is an act, as is violence. Um, Anger is an emotion. And uh, when people have problems with their anger, they can often get aggressive. The difference between anger management and domestic violence in terms of counseling is that domestic violence counseling is monitored by the courts. There's a a prescribed 52-week program that can be curriculum-based or not. Um, And the folks who do it are monitored by the probation department whether or not their clients are self-referred or not. And by the way, we, we don't often get self-referred. We get either spouse-ordered or someone who uh, speaks to God through the SWAT team and has a religious experience and winds up, you know, being sent to us. So, so we, have, we have those things happening. Um, anger management can be um, a, a program that goes for four weeks or ten weeks or Some people do it for a weekend. It's not monitored by the state at all. And oftentimes it's ordered by, by, even in family court, it's ordered. Uh, But when a judge says 52 weeks of anger management, that's code for domestic violence. So, Alice, are the perpetrators of domestic violence or anger management, aggression, but definitely domestic violence, are they born with biological traits towards anger and aggression, or are they in part or in whole victims of their environment? Well, we don't do a lot with the brain, although we do some. Um, Most of the, the men we work with who are actual perpetrators of domestic violence and Uh, perpetrate in patterns of behavior in a a wide range, not just physical, but psychological abuse, controlling behavior. Most of them come from very traumatic childhoods. And the way I found that out was when I started my program in 1979, I talked to the women in our shelter about what I needed to know about their partners And they overwhelmingly said they come from violent families. You know, that's really good that they could supply that information because being in the divorce business, even though I don't really deal with domestic violence, that truly has to go to the attorneys, not a non-attorney mediator uh, or paralegal. But I have been taught by my colleagues who are therapists that at least when you're in a mediation and there's a lot of anger or, or, or you have separately uh, time talking to the spouses, 
I was taught to ask what the parental relationships were like with the, the spouse exhibiting that behavior. And because that really opens up the victim's ability to maybe understand, not blame, you still have to deal, but at least they can understand that, not take it personally, so to speak? Well, it's sort of, after a point, I think a lot of the partners understand, but after a point, it sort of doesn't matter because there's so much impact on their lives. And so, so that, you know, the forgiveness part of it doesn't actually start until they have some change in behavior that's sufficient enough for them to believe that this person actually is going to change. And I did want to say one other thing about uh, being born with it. Some people are born with more volatile dispositions, you know, temper- temperamentally, but we've got people who are both volatile and passive in our groups, and everything in between. Where I've seen a more situational kind of domestic violence has been when we've had clients who come in and they've been in war. So they've come out of Iraq and they're they're changed. They're they're trained to react. And I remember talking to one young man and his girlfriend separately. And um, she said, you know, before he went to Iraq, he thought before he acted. When he got back from Iraq, he acted before he thought. So we had to almost detox him and get him back into, and and he said the same thing, and they said those things separately. Um, So there are situations where people are in very um, survival kind of mode where they carry that into it's a kind of chronic combat readiness. I understand. And and I, I do, I accept what you say about, well, forgiveness, that's, that's in the future and a lot has to happen before you get that. But at least if you're dealing with somebody who has propensity towards domestic violence, to understand where it comes from allows the victim maybe to react a little differently and maybe take the blame out. As a mediator, this is important that people manage their emotions um, while they're making settlement decisions. That's, That's really where I'm coming from. To understand is to know how to control yourself, know where you want to go, um, I guess, as the victim. Well, there... The, the issue with that is, you know, the, the old saying, it takes two to tango. Usually in domestic violence, it only takes one. Because when that person tangos, the other person can stay quiet and there can still be rage attached to them remaining quiet and not, not you know, interacting. Or they can get angry, or they can be quietly saying things. So at the moment that the the rage is happening, there's almost nothing right that the person can do. And what I found is by the time they get to counseling or the time they get to a place where they're getting divorced, usually the victim has had it up to their eyeballs and everything else is overflow. So they do understand for quite a period of time. but after a while, the understanding kind of dries up. And, okay, I understand. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, all right, now, and, and this is the last piece of this particular uh, question segment, but once a divorce is filed for Alice, and now we're going to segue into you, Warren, once a divorce is filed for Alice, can latent tendencies towards aggression surface? And can you describe what that's like? Actually, I call that loss-specific or divorce-specific aggression. And the way we look at that is when we're doing an assessment. Uh, And I've had women come in and say, do you think he's going to hurt me? Do you think he's going to kill me? We're getting divorced, and he's kicked things. He's grabbed me. He's done things that are atypical. And nobody behaves, well, most people 
I guess if you're in Marin and you're doing high flow therapy, maybe you behave better. Um, and if there's a mutual kind of agreement about the divorce, you're both you're both there and you both want it. But if one person wants it more than the other, um, we have seen aggression surface, whether that be uh, verbal, emotional, uh, put downs, physical things. They can happen situationally where there has been no previous pattern of domestic violence. And so I look at that as a situational thing. And that person can probably go into some anger management and get support and tools and be able to handle that and work with their anger during the divorce. We have men in our program right now that are going through high conflict divorces. And the program is really helping them because they have a place to tap in every week. They have other people who are not only supporting them, but also confronting their behavior. Uh, Alice, if I could jump in there. Um, I think Alice has outlined something that's really important, which is a distinction between situational domestic abuse or uh, situational conflict, um, which is triggered uh, by the divorce and a pattern of domestic abuse. Now, Alice, you, 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 you have assessment tools where you think you can identify whether it's situational or a pattern? Well, the assessment tool I use is the victim. I, I usually interview them each separately, and I hear the story and the new revised edition of the story, and then I look at how they compare. And I ask them questions like, do you like your partner? And Judith, when you were saying, uh, you ask about the, the families, I ask people, do you like your mother? Do you like your father? Um, do you, and, and usually uh, the victim is able to talk about, yeah, this is out of character, you know, and they will say that. You know, oftentimes judges see that as somebody wanting to get a leg up on custody. But I've met with women that are really afraid because they've, been vicariously traumatized, and then they watch 2020 and Primetime Mystery and all these shows where this otherwise nice guy turns around and kills his wife and kids. And they, because it's out of character, they are afraid that he is going to become this person, even though there's been no history. The the way it helps me as an attorney um, is when I'm either defending or bringing a domestic violence uh, restraining order application because I need to know whether it's situational or there's a pattern of abuse. Um, the, perp- the, the, fr- the legal framework is um, under the family code is uh, 60, 6220 and 6300. And the purpose of, of granting a restraining order is to um, allow a cooling off period to um, create a period of separation to protect the victim from further abuse. And I think there's a misapprehension with many attorneys. Uh, They see the statute and they think that a single act of abuse, if you can just simply uh, approve abuse, whether it's physical abuse, a threat of abuse, emotional, psychological abuse, uh, that in and of itself is sufficient to ground a restraining order. And one of my favorite cases of recent years in 2018 is a case called Fisher. Unfortunately, Fisher was depublished, um, which means that you're not allowed to cite the case. And this was one of those situational cases where uh, the wife, they were in the middle of getting divorced, and the wife came home unexpectedly on her birthday to find the husband getting a massage and was getting text messages from his girlfriend. Well, what do you think she did? She hit the roof. She grabbed the phone. She smashed the phone. And then when he tried to grab the phone back from her, she slapped him around the face and was like, how dare you? Well, guess who brought the restraining order application? The husband. The husband. And the judge, I mean, if you ask anyone, um, we have a phrase in England called the, the man or the woman on the Clapham omnibus. <laughs> it's like your typical. I don't know what's the what's the American uh, equivalent of that, Joe Schmo. I don't know what is it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, 
Anyway, so if you ask most people out in the street or on the Clapham Mummery bus, they'd say, well, of course you wouldn't grant a restraining order in that situation. And the trial judge didn't. The trial judge again said, well, first of all, we've got a two-step process. First, we, we look to see if there's actually abuse. We look to see if there's intentional or reckless uh, acts of bodily harm or intent uh, uh, to threaten bodily harm. And in this case, it said, no, it wasn't. That she, she, she acted on the spur of the moment. There was no intent or recklessness, number one. But number two is even if she had, you don't need a restraining order for that because the, as soon as she moves out of the house or he moves out of the house and things cool down, it's not going to happen again. And so um, that will be a situation where, the, uh, where an attorney, I think, is, is trying to get a litigation advantage. Because when you have a restraining order, um, particularly where there's children, it kicks in a presumption that you cannot have joint custody. Now, you can overcome that presumption, but the presumption kicks in. And so if I'm defending someone, that's, that's one of the issues I'm looking out for. Is this, is this a, a pattern of abuse, looking at the severity of the abuse, the proximity of the abuse? How, how recently the abuse was, or was it just a situational one-off? Um, and you know, Warren, when you said, do I have tools to assess that? Actually, just uh, based on my experience, the questions I ask people, um, generally I get at that. I get it whether it's a pattern or not. And um, it, it's not really difficult, or it hasn't been, to get at establishing whether it's a pattern or if it's a one-off, like you said. Um, you interview the people separately. Uh, you ask them some conversational questions. You ask them how they handle conflict uh, when they have an argument. Um, you ask them if they've ever laid hands on each other. What was the situation? You ask them if they ever call names, what kind of names, you know. And you want to find out about frequency. You want to find out about intensity. Are there threats? What kind of threats? A lot of people make threats that are, well, you're not going to have, you know, you're not going to get the money yeah. during a divorce, yeah. but they don't carry it out. Yeah. So I, I want to see also, um, there are threats that are made that people take very seriously and yeah. they frighten them. And yeah. once they hear that threat, it stays with them. Mm -hmm. So you're really looking at the nature of what is the qualitative nature of what's happening in this family, right? And that raises, I mean, that raises a whole new issue. So let's say you've got the case. You've got the situation where there's a pattern of abuse. So over a number of months or years, there's this pattern of abuse. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, Alice, to talk about the cycle of violence. Well, wait a minute. Um, but before, that presents... Before you go there, <laughs> I, I, I want to stay with this one point. Am I jumping ahead? I will get there in a second, Warren. But before we leave this, I appreciate that you picked up on Alice when it's not part of the profile. It's, it's situational. But what do you do? What are your options as an attorney? Um, if you do have a pattern of violence, anger, and aggression, or even verbal bullying, as an attorney, what are your options to support your client in a situation like this? Now, are you? Re am I representing the victim? Well, let's you? let's do both. You're representing the victim versus the perpetrator. What are your options in both cases? How do you counsel your clients? Um, typically, the client in that situation will be um, uh, seeing a therapist, and that's one thing I would advise. If you are uh, representing the victim. I think both. Oh, actually. both. You're right. No, I think absolutely. generally going through a high conflict divorce with or without domestic violence, with or without you know, substance abuse, I think therapy or marriage and family counseling is, is terribly helpful. Um, and then if I'm representing the victim, obviously I have to understand the dynamics of the abuse and I'm doing what every attorney does in every case that so we're marshalling the evidence to try and prove our case. Um, and then um, also, and, and this is a little different from perhaps um, a lot of type of situ legal situations, I'm focused not on just getting the restraining order, but I'm also focused on what type of uh, relief 
in terms of, you know, the length of the restraining order, um, what kind of restraining orders, what personal conduct orders, what stay away orders are appropriate. Also, whether um, a, a, a 52-week batterers program is indicated. And so I, I'm looking to, to get all the relief that will protect my client, assuming that we'll win the case. What if you're representing the victim, there are minor children, very young minor children, and your client is very much afraid of her or his address being provided to the perpetrator? Well, you, on, the, on the paperwork, you can keep that confidential. Okay. Um, and so uh, that's, that's important. Um, I mean, one thing until the judge's orders come down, until this can all be sorted out. Yeah, well, or, it's, it's still it remains confidential. Uh, but actually, you, you, there is a there is one thing you've just you've you've reminded me. One of the most important things I will tell the client, and I will repeat this over and over again, is the way that most restraining orders play out is initially uh, one goes in to get a temporary restraining order. Um, those are often done without notice to the other side. Um, and then, by law, there has to be a hearing within 21 days. And so you then have to serve the TRO, um, the temporary restraining order, and then there's a hearing. Now, sometimes the hearing might be continued so that the, uh, the, the alleged abuser can get an attorney. Um, but I find frequently that in that period, in the period between getting the TRO and having the hearing, one of the tactics that abusers often use is to try and um, get the, the victim to come back or break that restraining order. Now, that's not untypical of what happens actually during the, 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 the relationship, is that they're, you know, and, and that's why I was trying to get Alice to talk about, as she will talk about, the cycle of violence. We but that's pretty typical. So the one thing, and I've had this happen, Time and time again, as soon as you got the TRO, you serve the TRO, it could be, the sheriff serves it on the, on the alleged abuser, and then they get to work. They break it. They try and they say to the victim, why don't we just, look, we can work things out. We can, uh, let's meet at Starbucks and have a cup of coffee and work it out. Or well, let's mediate. We don't need to do, you know, let's go meet at a, media, a mediator's office. Or I've actually had cases where, They've bought really, really expensive jewelry, like, you know, $20,000 diamond ring and flowers and, and just lavishing the affection and saying, it's going to be okay. We're going to work it out. And so um, in the worst case scenario, the, the woman usually um, falls for it and she will withdraw the petition, or withdraw yeah. the application. And I've had that happen. And, yeah. um, that, and, and, of course, once that happens, you know, game over. But if she falls for that and meets him at Starbucks or, uh, well, not now because there's COVID, but um, when we get back to normal. Some are open, um, by the way. Some are opened. Are they really? Yes, you, you have to leave the house, Warren, to know that. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I don't leave the house. Um, I know you don't. So, but, but the problem is that if you go to court and you have a hearing and then, you know, these, these people are meeting and, uh, the first thing the judge is going to say, do you really need a restraining order if you're meeting this person, you know, several yeah. times since the TRO was granted? Common sense would probably say no. Well, the part of the issue, I think, is that people think if you're afraid of your partner, you're always afraid of your partner. And that's just not true. Usually people are only afraid when they see some kind of precursor to abusive behavior. So they'll go periods of time. It's not like the fear, the fear is there and it doesn't take a lot to wake it up. But usually um, they're not afraid all the time. And they're certainly not afraid when the person is being nice. Like, you know, the, the men in my group have said, she's using that as a power tool. She's using it as a clout. She's using that restraining order to control me. And I said, well, is that the only way she's ever had? Is that the voice that she had? But I said, how often have you gone over there when you violated the restraining order? You're having a really wonderful, nice dinner. 
and your partner says, excuse me a minute, and goes and calls the police and says, hey, he's violating the restraining order. I've never had anybody tell me that that's happened. The restraining order is used um, when they're afraid. And the other piece is that oftentimes it's not used because they're afraid their partner's going to lose their job if they have a career that's dependent on not having domestic violence on it. Uh, or the Department of Children and Family Services has gotten, uh, has gotten uh, involved in this case. And they say, well, if you're talking about that kind of abuse, then you're failing to protect your child. And, and you know, Warren, about parent alienation. That's come up a lot of times when somebody has alleged abuse. All right, so let, I'm sorry, Alice, is it time to talk about the um, cycle of violence, violence theory? <laughs> We're going all over the place. That's Judith. okay, I'm going to keep you straight, I'm going to keep you straight, but I think this is important, I think everybody should know about this. Well, the cycle of violence, which Warren has also described very well, was uh, developed by Lenore Walker, who was the mother of the movement, and uh, it's basically three phases. There's um, the tension building phase, the acute incident, and the honeymoon or loving respite. And if you apply that to a regular relationship, that happens in a regular relationship, that we, there's tension that builds up, we have an argument, and then we make up. The difference is in a domestically violent relationship, um, the tension, everything's exacerbated. So the tension could be worse. The tension can uh, trigger fear, which in a healthy relationship, it triggers, I don't want to have this fight, but it doesn't trigger the same fear. Then the acute incident. And the acute incident can be verbal. It can be psychological. It can be, I mean, I've had people burst in when their partner was having a friend, friends over, a women friends. and created such a scene that it was so embarrassing that she doesn't want to have her friends over anymore. So you see the development of isolation. Um, or it could be a physical incident. And after that happens, there's a period of respite. Now, that happens in most cases. If people have been through the cycle over and over again, the loving respite can actually disappear and in extreme cases of violence, the absence of violence is seen as the loving respite. So, but during the loving respite, and that can go on for a period of time, depending on the person, the victim has an opportunity to develop learned hopefulness. And learned hopefulness is that between episodes, I now have evidence that we can have a better relationship and I hope that it's going to stay that way. Warren, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think I think um, Alice is the 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 you know world renowned expert on this, and um, I would bring Alice in as an expert in the kind of case where um, there is that cycle of violence, and one of the questions is that's going to come up, and the abuser's uh, attorney is going to keep. Uh, harping on this is, well, if he was violent, why did you go back to him? Why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you go to domestic violence shelter? And they're going to say, well, if you, if you didn't do that, either one, it didn't happen. So if, you, if it's a he said, she said um, situation, you don't have tangible evidence such as photographs or witnesses. Um, it's going to undermine the credibility of the victim. And then the other argument that the uh, council is going to make is, well, Your Honour, she's not afraid of him because she keeps going back. And now, I actually think that misstates the, the, the legal framework. I don't think there's anything in the statute that says you actually have to be afraid of uh, your accuser at any particular moment in time. Um, but Alice actually did actually explain, uh, talked about that uh, chronic apprehension um, so that uh, victims are, are not, free, you know, always and continuously afraid 
uh, of their partners, but there is this chronic apprehension that builds up. And then in the cycle of violence a stage where there's an explosion, an incident, then maybe during that phase, they're fearful and afraid. And so um, in that situation, I'm trying to bring Alice in or an, uh, some explain to the judge who may not be familiar. I think these days most judges have been trained and should be um, familiar with the cycle of violence. But um, I'm trying to educate the judge and explain these these apparent inconsistencies or anomalies. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there's only one case um, called Fragoso against Hernandez that's actually talked about the cycle of violence. And that was quite extreme. That was where a TRO had actually been granted. And then, again, a birthday party, the, the couple had uh, consensual sex. And... Um, you know, he said, well, then she's not afraid of me. I couldn't have been violent. And the court actually granted the restraining order and then cited the cycle of violence and said, you know, the, the parties post uh, TRO sex was part of their a six-year repeated cycle of violence, gifts, forgiveness, sex, and then repeated acts of abuse. And so it's really important for both attorneys and judges to understand that uh, pattern. So. I'm going to refresh our memories to the Nicole Brown Simpson, O.J. Simpson, unfortunate murder. And what impressed me with that, since domestic violence was very much part of their history, and it speaks to the cycle of violence uh, theory that you've both been talking about, there was repeated aggression and violence. And my understanding, and you may know more than I on this, my understanding is Nicole kept going back for social events. Well, they were co-parents, so they, they had their children's lives to, to, to support. And so we have the dance recital on the day of the murder. Is that a good example of the cycle of violence and Nicole not stopping it or taking a stand somehow to prevent more violence? Yeah, and I think there's, I, I think that is an example, certainly a famous example of that. Um, and, but I also, you know, Daniel Amen, when you were talking about people born one way or the other, um, Daniel Amen um, did a um, massive piece of research doing CAT scans on men's brains and women's brains. And he said women's brains are more wired to empathy. Now, that could be because societally we're supposed to be empathetic and we're pushed in that direction about understanding someone else's point of view. Uh, and it's not to say men aren't empathetic. It's just that women light up more around empathy, uh, their brains. So the other piece of that, and we used to say this when I worked at a battered women's shelter, that the women over-empathized. When they had a little break from the violence, and I know, Warren, you see this with your clients, a little break from it, and they had a few days to recover, maybe a week, maybe things were better, they start forgiving the partner or empathizing with the partner, saying nobody would understand him like I do. I know what he's been through. Judith, when you were talking about um, the, uh, the understanding, if you can understand uh, where somebody's been or why they are the way they are, what we see is when there was uh, a respite that most of the women we worked with would wind up sort of under getting back into that empathy mode. And so I think that keeps people going back too, is that they are able to empathize with that part of it. But certainly I don't think that most women, it takes a lot to believe your partner is going to kill you. And I don't think most women go there. And, I, and I'm not sure if he ever threatened. I don't know if he threatened to kill her or not. I know that I can say this because he never came to my group. He was, he was referred to my program, but he bought out. He had a really good attorney who got him into one-on-one -on -one therapy by the phone with someone who didn't know domestic violence um, and probably didn't have Nicole's 
right? Nicole's picture of what was going on. And I don't think, and Warren, you can correct me. I mean, therapists. I, I was going to say, I don't think Nicole followed through on her opportunities to get legal help or help from the court or the plea. I don't know that she did. I think she kept the relationship going and this is how it ended. Do you think there might be denial? I know we're theorizing, but do you think there might be denial? And is that something that victims experience, denial? What do you think? Well, certainly. And children do too. Okay. Then is the empathy piece that... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alice. Well, I think there's both things happening. I think there's denial happening, and I think, but I think that a lot of the denial is also with the perpetrator, because I have many groups who say, "Well, she knows I wouldn't do that," and I said, "Have you ever done something that you said you wouldn't do?" And most of them have. They've gone further than they thought they would, and I've had guys who were mildly violent and then they did something like one of the men in my program pushed his wife on the couch and broke her neck he didn't mean to break her neck but he broke her neck she was in a halo for six months she's not going to forget that if he reaches out to her again to lay hands on her um i had another man in group who slapped his wife across the face very first incident that ever happened but he knocked her eye out of the socket and she's blind in that eye, and neither one of them will forget that because they see she's disfigured in that eye. So there are things that happen that can be, you know, from someone who does what would be considered a mild act of aggression, pushing or slapping on the conflict tactic scale, that's listed as mild a mild act of aggression, but they can have very serious consequences, which will for sure stick with that that uh, person. And I think Nicole Brown Simpson had a black eye. I think I'm not sure what her other, you know, I don't know all of them. Right. You know? Well, Alice, then do you feel, if, if women are hardwired to be empathetic by and large, would that then in itself be the Achilles heel a woman would have that would have her going back? looking for the hopefulness that you had mentioned earlier. Well, and should we be careful about that, empath- that empathetic uh, gene? Well, the, prob- the problem is that empathy is a really great trait. And a lot of the really great traits that people have, they can't change just because they're in a bad relationship. That's part of the issue. That's part of, I think, why they you know, might go to therapy or they might go to a women's support group or a self-help group because, um, and there are battered women's support groups and, and personal empowerment groups that the shelters all over LA County and Orange County um, provide services like that. And it, part of it is getting this ongoing support. When you don't tell somebody, most people even if they're not physically isolated by their partner, they become emotionally isolated because they don't want to tell their friends and their family what's going on. So they want people to like their partner. They want people to hang around with, and they don't want anybody to think they have bad taste. So they stop telling, so they become emotionally isolated, you know, in that process of being protective of their relationship and of their partners as well. I just want to jump in and pick up on something because I don't want to uh, gloss over it. It's something that Alice said. Uh, Alice runs a group. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is that the, um, under, the under the restraining order uh, statutes, the court has discretion to, um, to order uh, that uh, 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 an abuser attends a 52-week batterers program that's certified by the probation department. And one of the things that all invariably happens is that once uh, a judge uh, it finds a, restra- uh, a restraining order, 
uh, the abuser's counsel will always say, well, let's divert the, the abuser into individual therapy, anger management. That's going to be sufficient. We'll do like 12 weeks or whatever instead of going to that 52-week program. And I want to ask Alice, why do you think the batterer's program might be more beneficial? I think it's really beneficial because there are specific core issues that we work on. Um, I do men's groups. I don't have a women's group. Um, I've worked individually with women who are abusive, but I, I have, when working with the men, I'm working with them on their expectations based on gender. Uh, and we have gay and straight men in our groups. So, uh, that can be different based on whether you have a heterosexual relationship or, or a same-sex relationship. But um, we work on specific tools, anger management tools, that include preventative thinking, that, inc that include things like body awareness, that includes positive self-talk and cognitive behavioral skills, that include empathy, training people for empathy, that also look at trauma. We work with, uh, with the men in our program on their trauma as well. So there are things that perpetrators programs work with that are much more expansive than, say, maybe an anger management group. Plus, the length of time makes a difference. Ten weeks in an anger management group doesn't change a belief system. It doesn't create behavior that's internalized. When you've got 52 weeks, you have at the very least the beginning of somebody being able to recognize their own escalation cycle, maybe um, uh, take a, a halfway decent time out, maybe empathize a little bit with their partner. But 52 weeks for a lot of the men that we work with is not enough time. Right now in my uh, Thursday night group, we have uh, 10 men. All but three of them have been in group for two years up to 13, all of their own volition. The three new guys are all uh, family court ordered. Oh, no, one is criminal court ordered. The other two are family court ordered. And um, what they get from the other men, that's the other thing, that it's not just therapists that are, you know, feeding them any information. They've got men who've been in group for a longer period of time who can say to them, I used to think that way. I didn't realize this. I didn't understand why my partner could be afraid of me. So the men contribute so much to the other men in group. And uh, that's because they've been there long enough to have something to contribute. Do you, do you, do you, do you have people, that the newbies that come in, that are sent there by family court, and they, they feel that they shouldn't be there that, you know, we're not really domestic abusers or we're not gangbangers or we're not criminals. Yeah. How, now, how does that dynamic work with the other members in the group when they come in and they either try and deny or minimize their, 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 their abuse? Well, the great thing about that is a lot of the guys will say to them, you know, I used to talk like that too, but I've learned something. I've learned something about that when I started raising my voice, or I started looking a certain way, or I started calling names, my partner got afraid of me, and it changed everything in my relationship. And if I wanted my relationship or another relationship to be healthy, I had to change what I did. And yeah, they most of the people come in, even if they're criminal court ordered, they come in and say, I shouldn't be here, or my partner's a liar, or my partner provokes me. And I say, you know, I don't know anybody. I think I provoke my partner too, you know, but I don't pay that kind of a price for it. So we all provoke our partners. It's sort of like what, what happens when we provoke our partners? We might get angry. Might, we might walk away. We might talk to them for a little bit, but we don't terrorize them. We don't create fear in them. That's, that's the, the punishment does not fit the crime. And so part of what we're trying to do is teach perspective and, and perception. We work on somebody's perception because a lot of people who grow up in violence see threat in things that the rest of us wouldn't see threat in. 
So they respond as if they're being attacked when in fact they're not. And so, that, you know, there are a lot of nuanced kinds of things that you do in a perpetrator's group that don't just happen in an anger management group. I hate to end our session now, but I have to. I was going to ask you, and maybe I can invite you both back and talk about how this uh, affects when you have children as part of the divorce and you have one aggressive or violent person, and now we're dealing with the co-parenting plan um, and alone time with the children. Is, is, can you address this within one or two minutes just to give people a little information before we go? And then we can flesh this out larger when we get back together again. Warren, do you want to talk about that? Or the parenting so I, I'll, de I'll defer to you on that because I think what's you know, important is the, is the interpersonal dynamic and how it affects the children, how you can protect the children. Well, I, wanted, I want people to know how you do this legally because they need a framework not only of how to deal with it emotionally, but legally. So maybe you could both take a minute and speak from your own positions as professionals, what you do in this case. Well, we had a man in our group that I also did parenting with uh, separately. Um, I, uh, I co-authored with Jane Schatz a parenting curriculum 12-week parenting curriculum for people who've been involved in abusive relationships. And it's a little different and includes sort of all kinds of things that happen in a regular divorce. And then what happens specifically because there's been domestic violence. So there are parenting programs. Um, I've done parenting plans. I think it's very difficult unless there's been some time for people to heal a little bit and get their voice back. Um, I, I think sometimes we rush people into things that they wouldn't be ready for, even if they were in a regular divorce. That's such a good point. That's such a good point that in a divorce, you can't just meet that six month minimum. If there's a lot to discuss, you need to breathe. You need to let some time go by where nothing happens. You just yeah. regroup. Warren, how about you? Uh, how do you work with your clients uh, when there are children of a domestic violence situation? Well, I mean, the, the tools that the family court have and the tools that you have are sort of limited. You've got your have therapy and then you have the parenting plan and, you know, restricting uh, access, restricting visitation is all that you can do. Now, you can use those tools as maybe an incentive to modify behavior. Um, but at the, uh, the, uh, the other side of the coin is to protect the children by limiting, you know, exposure and hope that the, uh, the abuser gets treatment and help and uh, modifies their behavior. I, I know from talking to people, you know, that, come, that call my office, this is the, one of the most frightening things one parent has uh, if they have to go to court, that the other spouse who would be the perpetrator would get to be with the kids alone, that the judge wouldn't understand, wouldn't see, and would order the children to be alone with the perpetrator. Biggest fear, isn't it, Warren? Yeah, in, in those extreme circumstances, and, and where the court has the power to uh, make an order for supervised visitation, it's you have a, be a professional monitor or you can have a, 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 a non-professional monitor who abides by certain guidelines, usually a friend or impartial third party, uh, but usually the professional monitor is, is the better option, but most people really can't afford that. And one of the problems of having a professional audit is that sometimes because of the cost, um, it basically prevents you from having any visitation. Uh, and the other problem is that the supervised monitors, there's no consistent training and certification of them. So basically anyone can become a monitor. And so the standards vary widely. Well, and, and I, I'm, I'm and sorry. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that is a real fear that is grounded in reality, that, that oftentimes the judges are not recognizing domestic violence. Um, even... I've had cases where we've had a lot of evidence and maybe there hasn't been an incident for a year 
and and the judge says, well, when are we going to just get over this? You know? I know. I've heard it. I hate to end this because it's so fascinating to me, and I know it's to the listeners, but I want to thank you both from being on the show, and I would like yes. people to be able to get in touch with you. So, Alice, first, how would people get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch with me is to call me. I have a website, alicelaviolette.com. My cell number is 310-968-4203. I'm not one more a time. With one, one more time. Say it one more time. That number, once again, 310-968-4203. And your website address? Is Alice, A-L-Y-C-E, LaViolette, L-A-V-I-O-L-E-T-T-E, dot com. And your name will be on Podbean when we upload the episode next week. So they, they'll be able to see it. And Warren, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, they can call me at 310-247-9913. That's Again. 310-247-9913. Um, I have a website, la-familylaw.com. That's la-familylaw.com. Or they could email me at wsheel, S-H-I-E-L-L, at la-familylaw.com. Thank you both very, very much. And thank all of you for listening to Constructive Uncoupling, the podcast devoted to amicable divorces. I'm Judy Weigley, your host. And you can get in touch with me at my email address, Judy, J-U-D-Y, at constructiveuncoupling.com. Judy at constructiveuncoupling.com. Please share this with your friends. Be a subscriber. It will upload immediately every Wednesday. Thank you once again, and we will see you next week.